welcome to today's podcast interview. I brought on Clint Hatton. Clint, welcome. Hi, Heather. It's uh, I'm excited to talk to you. You got a lot of energy and I think a lot of insight. And so I think this is going to be a fun conversation. Yes. For those that are new to you, please give a little background. Where do you live and what do you do? I live in McKinney, Texas, which is just a suburb, a very large suburb of Dallas. And what I do now is I'm a transformational speaker, coach. I'm an author and uh, really have just kind of immersed myself. I've really been coaching and mentoring for about 20 years, but I jumped into this personal development space, if we want to say it that way, only in the last year, just due to some life changes and th- some things I experienced. So just love helping people always have. And for me, I love I love your title, you know, Mind Over Matter, because to me, truly, mindset dictates your life. So I'm, I'm really excited to see where we end up today and what we dig into. Well, I would love to hear your perspective on that. What do you believe mindset is or what's your experience with mindset? Yeah, well, I think ultimately you get what you think about. You know, I, I just, for example, go back to my, uh, you know, earlier life. I'll give you a little bit of a, a background there. I, around 11 or 12, I lived a pretty normal life. Grew up in Southern California, you know, going to the beach, hanging out at our pool, you know, just loving life. But around 11, my dad ended up having an affair um, and he didn't just end up having an affair. He ended up moving into an apartment with this other woman. And she had a son that was two years older. Now I have a brother, but he was eight years older and had moved hundreds of miles away. So I'm just with my mom. And during that season, she ended up just really suffering. She was drinking too much. She had suicidal ideation, almost killed me a couple of times in that particular season of our life. And they ended up reconciling within a year and a half, two years. We ended up having a good relationship, but it started me down a journey of drug and alcohol abuse. And if it wasn't for being an athlete, who knows, I probably would have imploded very quickly, but I I was an athlete. I kept straight long enough for that. But ultimately it was some bad coping mechanisms. And so, you know, I just seemed to just struggle in life with relationships. I struggled with um, finances. I struggled with any kind of a, of a clear path on what I even want to do on this planet, you know? And I think what I realized fast forwarding, to about 30, 31 years old, you know, we had a little pre-conversation. That's when I started immersing myself with some mentors, people who now we call it personal development. I didn't even have a term for it back then, but they would just talk about, you know, how your mind works and what you think about is ultimately the results you end up getting in life. And if you're negative, you attract negativity. If you're angry, you attract anger and, and angry people. And, and I just realized that golly, at least for me, that's really true, you know? And so then I realized that once I began to think differently than things in my life, and it doesn't mean you don't get, you know, gut punches in life. It doesn't mean everything is perfect all the time, but it just literally, my life began to change for the positive. And I began to see many more things happen in my life that I wanted to happen because that's what I was believing in. Well, I think that's what happens to many people, right? We're going through life through autopilot from conditioning, society, our culture, family, whatever. And a lot, well, it seems most people don't have their quote, wake up until something bad happens, hitting rock bottom, bankruptcy, divorce, a health scare. For me, I kind of, and I shared with you, you know, I've been reading personal development since I was a teen, never felt like I fit in, try to fit in chase the American dream until I was 30. And I was like, nah, this isn't for me. But anyway, the the idea of what I wrote down when you were sharing that, that thoughts truly become things. And as an example, I feel a lot of people have the word karma wrong. People talk Mm. about karma. You did something bad. It's going to come back to you. And I have experienced and believe karma just is life is a boomerang. What you put out, you get back. And when you understand the game of it, and you in, are intentional, then like there is no limit. I don't, even the sky is the limit. No, your belief system is. So maybe can you share some real life tangible examples on how you turn the ship around? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, to that question, I'll actually kind of do both. I have an example, you know, I've again, been coaching, mentoring people for many, many years now for about 20 years of that, a chunk of that was with marriages. My wife and I have worked with marriages and typically Uh by the time they got to us, they were in crisis. So unfortunately we didn't get too many couples are like, Hey, 
how do we actually continue to have a solid marriage is usually after things imploded. But what I found interesting, and I've seen it play out over and over, over the last 20 plus years, is people repeat the same kind of disastrous relationships, and not necessarily a marriage either. It can be an, even in friendships over and over and over again. And what's always blown me away, and I, I can tell by the way you're responding, you've had this experience, is they seem to just discount the fact that there was only one common denominator in all these different relationships. And that was them. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Yeah. And so to me, that those examples speak to exactly what you're saying. And you're so right that they just haven't understood yet. They haven't unearthed that they have this thinking pattern that they end up attracting and the same person basically repackaged with a different name. And, and then they end up in the same situations over and over. And I think that can be true with, you know, jobs and lots of other things as well. A hundred percent on that note, I, I want to give an example. I've talked about this in dating relationships before my own kind of aha, but yeah, wherever you go, there you are, but I'll give an example. So I, I had a conversation with a woman in the last couple of months who was seeking coaching and help. And she's like, in the last six months, I'm on my third job. I keep getting bullied at my jobs. Mm. And this one guy, he's about to get fired, you know, very much victim mentality. And I was like, Hello. Uh, what's the <laughs> common denominator in all of those jobs and situ? You know, it's you. Like you're not a bully. So you know, wherever somebody's at in their life, I truly love sharing the message that we are not victim to circumstance. We are creators, and you simply given your power away when you're blaming. So maybe you could talk about that in the marriage counseling. When we're blaming our partner, aren't they a mere reflection of what's going on internally? Yeah, which, you know, to that point, that's a very interesting thing when you start working with, um, especially a couple that's been married maybe for a little while. And then now they're throwing around the D word, right? Divorce. And they're just like mortal enemies almost. Yeah. And so a couple of things that we usually end up talking about is first and foremost, there's no one, like no one ever on the face of the planet went to the altar with the mindset, this is my enemy. And I'm going to spend every day for the la the rest of my life making this person's life hell, <laughs> right? Yeah. It wasn't right. like that, or you wouldn't have ended up there, right? Right. And so, so what happens is, uh, to your point, is they get caught in a cycle. More often than not, it has to do with very poor communication skills and how it always starts, right? Because yeah. poor communication skills will turn into a variety of really bad outcomes within a marriage. And then you'll, you know, you'll start looking for other people to validate you, which is how a lot of affairs ended up happening. And by the same token, it, just the opposite, um, I'll throw out the sex word, right? Bad sex within marriage. I'm talking about marriage right now. It's probably true outside of that too. But when you have really poor communication skills, you're probably not going to have a full sex life because there's body, soul, and spirit mixed into that, right? And you're only connecting on the body level. Yeah. And so when you learn how to take ownership of yourself, which again is why I love you keep pointing at yourself too, which is so awesome. When you take ownership of yourself, yeah. and in this case, develop healthy communication skills, it now, now then you know filters into other areas of your life. And like we have a tremendous sex life. Yeah. I believe that hundred percent has a lot to do with the fact that we've worked our butt off to have really healthy communication, you know, but the truth is most people come in and they're pointing the finger and they don't listen. Right. I'm sure you've run into this a million times where their listening skills have gone off the charts because they don't see their part to play in it. And all they're really looking for is either for that person to be proven wrong and or for whoever they're bringing into the scene, in this case, it was me as a, as a coach or a counselor, for me to validate them and discredit the other. And they're really not trying to come to a resolution. They're trying to be right. They're trying to get things their way. It's selfish, right? Yeah. And so when you can break that and, and get them to turn the spotlight, if you will, on themselves and actually listen to the other person, man, I've seen crazy seemingly doomed marriages turn around I'm thinking of one in my head right now, years and years and years ago, involved in fidelity, the whole nine yards that are just thriving years later because they were finally willing to do that. And we use this phrase, and then I'm going to bounce it back to you because I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, is we always say in those situations, this relationship needs a hero. 
someone needs to be a hero and and give. <laughs> well, on that note, because I've had clients, male and female, having affairs and doing all of that, but also I have found that one, and look, it doesn't just have to be in marriage and in many areas of life, people can be stuck in a job they're miserable in, but people stay because it's safe, it's predictable, it's known. Yep. And I don't, I don't truly believe people are afraid of the unknown. I think they're afraid of um, maybe change, but change is the only constant. And so, for example, I had somebody, um, I haven't talked to him in a while, but going through the motions a year prior, he had given an attorney a retainer, like sleeping in his son's bedroom, you know, like it was bad. Didn't want to go home. It was a very toxic environment. And then people use the thing, you know, we're staying for the kids. No, you are teaching the kids. You know, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. So here's what, um, excuse me. I want to ask you in a situation, because I, I liked how you use the word surviving when people are just surviving, like treading water in life, right. health, marriage, relationships, career, work, whatever, what can you suggest and offer? I know you're big on courage, but we can thrive in this lifetime. We don't have to just survive. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, and my, my philosophy on this has kind of changed over the years, which I think is a good thing, you know, cause I think we should always be growing. And uh, we've talked about this off air too. I think the minute you think you've figured everything out and you know, all there is to know you're, you're already off track, but yeah. where I've shifted, especially in the last few years is so many times when I would meet with a client in years past, we would immediately start trying to address what seemed to be the issue at hand, right? So they got anger issues or they don't trust and their fear rejection or whatever. And the propensity was to go right after that. And I feel like what I've really learned the last few years that I think is far more effective, I like to start with just kind of stopping that whole train, that emotional roller coaster that they're on, if you could say it that way, yeah. and, and slowing them down and saying, okay, let's talk about first, I like to hear them tell me their story in their own words. And the reason I like to do that is because often the language or the phrases or words that they use tell you a lot about how they see themselves, right? Even if they're talking about other people, you hear words and phrases that describe how they see themselves. Then I'll turn around and talk about, you know, are you the type of person that you really want to be? Now, most people, most people are very honest about that. And the answer is usually no. You know, I'm sure there's, there's outliers that, you know, answer differently, but usually that's the case. And so then we talk about, okay, now let's start writing out who do you want to be? Let's talk about the person you want to be before we start talking about how you're going to get results. And I have found that to be a real game changer for people. What's, what's been your, have you experimented with something kind of like that? Okay. So that's literally what I do for coaching. And what I wrote down, it, it's truly an identity shift. Yeah. And the metaphor I always use as an example, let's say somebody wants to lose a hundred pounds. And that's actually a qualifying question I ask people who are interested in coaching. I simply ask, so I'm going to ask you, do you believe somebody who is a hundred pounds overweight could lose a hundred pounds? Yes. I just, and I just want to know somebody's mindset. So yes, because that's my only question is, could somebody change? Yeah, could, right? hundred percent they could, but somebody who wants to lose, and I don't even use that word release, somebody who wants to release a hundred pounds. That's really good. I'm going to steal that, by the way. Yeah. Well, because think about it. Normally, if you lose something, you want to find it. You don't want to find that. Not, you want to let that good. shit go. But anyway, so if you want to release 100 pounds, it's literally an identity shift because your identity, Dispenza says it best, and I say it a little different, but I like his way. So he says that your personality, which is made up how you think, the actions you take, and your emotions. So think, act, and feel, create your personal reality. Example, New Year's resolutioners fail. 92% of people fail because they're trying to create change in their life, save more money, lose weight, whatever, yeah. as the same identity. And you literally have to become someone else. So this person who wants to lose 100 pounds has to envision somebody 100 pounds healthier 
who yeah. obviously is eating different, moving different, confidence, you know, it's literally a death of the old self. That's what I talk about. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And I think tied to that too is, is your why, right? Yeah. You know, why, why do you want to lose a hundred pounds? Why do you want to change this in your life? Because if at least this has been my experience, it's not that other people can't be a part of a motivating factor. You know, there's certain things I have, I have two boys, you know, there's definitely some things that I do partly for that reason. But at the end of the day, if I don't believe it. And if I don't want it for myself, it's not going to last. That's why all the people you're describing, not necessarily that want to lose a ton of weight, but just want to get in shape. I We go to the gym in January. We've been working out together for a very long time, many years. We go to the gym in January. It's like, oh God, here we go. Yeah. It's like everybody in the plants here. Let's just give it another three weeks, <laughs> you yeah. know, because most of them are going to be gone, you know? And I think that's why they don't have a clear why. They don't really even know why they're doing something. I want to ask you, I just wrote this word down because I want your perspective. What are your thoughts on accountability? Well, I think accountability is really critical. I think the thing that's been interesting in my observation over the years, I'm going to, I'm going to give you uh, an example here as well. So especially I've, I've, I've coached women too over the years. So it's not like I never coached women, but a male and especially coming from the church world, I coached a lot, disproportionately more men than women. Okay. And pornography is an issue that men across the board doesn't matter what their background is. doesn't matter ethnically, religiously. It's, it's an issue for a lot of men, you know, and I, I've, I've found it very interesting how many times over the years I'll ask the question you just asked, do you have anybody you're accountable to? Do you have an accountability partner? Oh yeah, totally, man. My, my, my buddy, Steve, I said, well, tell me about your buddy, Steve. Oh yeah. Well, he's in the same boat. I am, man. I mean, he, we both have just been struck. I'm like, dude, do you know how freaking stupid that is? Yeah. That's pretty much why in AA, whether you like AA or not, they don't put you with the guy who's still getting hammered. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so so I do believe accountability is is really important, but it's just as important who you bring into that accountability and that there's um, a mutual trust there. But then there's also this vulnerability that questions can be asked in both directions that are direct and cut to the chase. And, you know, you can't be afraid of the other person's feelings. I think there's some components that make it healthier. So here's my question on the accountability. Now, obviously people invest in coaching and mm -hmm. I call it accountability buddies for a reason because they want some to quote, hold them accountable. But for me, that's still putting all your power seeking external somebody to quote, control or discipline you. And I, yes, I like having accountability buddies. I've done masterminds and that's great if you're all vibing together at the same level. But I also believe very strongly you have to have self accountability. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, for example, something I did this this month, I, I was kind of bored and plateaued. And so I'm no names. I asked someone to join me on a 30 day challenge and we we set the parameters. We're going to run four miles, four days a week, the other three days, 40 minutes of activity. I don't care what you do. Right. Yoga, walk, ride your bike. What It didn't matter. And um, I'm still going. I think today was like day 15 and she quit after two days. I'm like, what kind of accountability was that? Yeah. So th yeah, that's well, what I'm saying. Like, do not always rely on other people. Yet it life comes down to you. No, it totally does. You know, I, I can give you another quick example. You know, when I, <laughs> when I went to write the book that I wrote recently, something I never done. And to be very candid with you, I have known for years that I needed to start writing books. And I've, I've had, I don't know how many people over the years asked me with just different parts of my story and experiences, even going back 15 years ago, well, you know, why haven't you written a book yet? So when I felt like I had made the decision one night to write the book, I knew I needed accountability. Mm. So I'd literally gotten off the phone with the gentleman who was kind of my last shove at this book. And I went into a living room area and I, you know, my wife is Amber Olson. I said, Hey, I just made a commitment. I'm writing the book. Now I have like my own five-step process to making courageous decisions. Drawing somebody into accountability is part of it. But to 
to your point, here's the truth behind it. All my bride can really do to hold me accountable is ask me questions about my progress. Yeah. At the end of the day, I still had to create, and I had my own way of writing that really worked for me. We don't need to get into that, but you know, I created a certain atmosphere. I had committed to a certain timeline every morning, a two-hour timeline, five days a week, blah, blah, blah. I had my strategy. I still had to work the strategy. Accountability doesn't get the work done for you. So you're so right. Okay. I'd love to hear this five-step process for, uh, you said, courageous decisions. What is that? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the very first one for me, and this is <laughs> kind of the most obvious of the bunch, uh, and yet it's not for a lot of people. And that is first, you have to decide what courageous decisions do I need to make in my life? You know, we've talked a lot about being in relationships or friendships that, you know, don't serve you and are bad or or careers or jobs or whatever. So part of that is, is taking a hard look at your life. Again, who do I want to be and what do I really want to do on this planet? And then, and then, so, okay, what courageous decisions do I need to make? So using the book as an example, you know, I knew I needed to write a book. So the first courageous decision was saying, (laughs) I'm going to write the book. So then in numbers two and three, to me, these aren't necessarily linear. I think they can be exchanged. Um, But, but I think two and three is the accountability factor which is how it worked for me when I was writing the book. I stepped into the other room and I you know, brought in my bride, who I knew, by the way, would hold the fire to me. So that wasn't some random choice or just because she happened to be my wife and was in the other room. I knew she would. Otherwise, I'd have found somebody else, right? So there was that. Number three, and that's where these timelines can be you know, offset just a little bit. She just happened to be in the room next to me. Number three is setting a definitive timeline. Now, I'm of the mindset that if you can do it right now, that's the best standard operating procedure, you know, like right now. Now, there may be cases where you can't for a variety of reasons, but you need to make a decision. I believe putting it on your calendar is one step of intention to put a timeline to it immediately. So this all happened very quickly. The book analogy is actually a pretty good, um, pretty good way of explaining it. So I went in the room, got the accountability from her. Her response was, Hey, you know, we have a friend who's a book publisher, Michelle, would you want me to text her and see if maybe you could sit down and talk with her? Okay. So here comes that immediate action. Right. So I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Now I didn't realize this was all going to happen as fast as it did. So it doesn't need to be this rapid, but literally she texted her and 20 minutes later, she texted back and she said, Hey, I would be glad to have coffee with you, but I'm actually doing a two-day workshop where I actually teach people about publishing and how to write a manuscript and just demystify some of the writing process and all that. Do you want to come as my guest? So immediately I'm like, done. And I moved my calendar. You know, I had stuff to do, yeah, but they weren't as important as that. That's part of it, right? So I just, okay, there's number three. I'm immediately taking action. And then I think ultimately, as as you start to do that, then you need to be able to to monitor your progress, right? As As you're taking these steps. But number five to me is probably the most important. And number five is once, this is what I recommend to my clients or anybody I'm talking to. Once you've made that first courageous decision and you've acted on it, not just thought about it, not just written it down, but you've actually acted on it, immediately write down, if you can come up with at least five, great. If it's only two, great. Write down immediately two more courageous decisions that you know you need to make and apply the same steps immediately. I call it stacking because I think once you've made a courageous decision, stepped outside of your own comfort zone and you've acted on it, there's never more uh, energy for that than right now in the moment. If you wait another month or two to make another courageous decision, yeah, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Okay, so I love this, but I have a question for you because I believe this is definitely somebody who's ambitious and driven and high achiever and somebody that can move past that resistance of the fear. But I have also found, and there's a statistic out there that 80% of adults admit to procrastinating. (laughs) <laughs> and I think, yeah. I don't know if it was part of number three, but one of the things you said was 
ultimately people are, are waiting for the quote right time, the ducks in a row. I, I have to get another degree or certificate. I'm not ready yet. And I just want to, my experience and my philosophy, you may never feel ready. You may never be ready. You need to start today. Stop talking yourself out of it. Yeah. And you'll figure it out along the way. And I think that's what, maybe that's, um, I don't know, one of my strengths that I don't, I try not to overthink. I just get started. Like podcasting, perfect example. Let yeah. me tell you from the beginning. I know I absolutely sucked. I didn't know what I was doing. I used to write out scripts and then read them, hoping it didn't sound like I was reading but I just got started and then it progressed and I changed the title and like, you're going to evolve, but get started. Yeah. I think you're so dead. I don't think that's defined necessarily in my five steps, but I think you just, I'm glad you said that because to me that, that really is a key to the whole thing. You know, I, I think I'm a good example of that too, because historically um, I have been someone who have had pockets in my life where I've made some really courageous decisions, but then I've had pockets where I've, I've called myself a coward, you know, where I, writing the book was one of them. You know, I put that off for 15, 20 years. Now, granted, this particular book, I felt really compelled to write with some very deep things that had happened in our life. But, you know, even that aside, once you get that habit, that I had had of wanting to research the fire out of everything before I ever act. Uh -oh. Usually what ends up happening, and this is actually what happened with when I was starting to even develop my website and starting to create the plan for my, what I'm going to do with coaching. Yeah. I read so many different people's websites, books, blogs, whatever, that I told a buddy of mine, I have literally studied myself into complete and utter confusion because <laughs> so many people had different ways of going about the ultimately the same thing. Right. Yeah. So I think you're a hundred percent right. You know, it, granted there's some things, you know, that like if I'm going to go, uh, you know, evil can evil with somebody I grew up with where he had, he would jump motorcycles over certain things. All right. I need to do some research. <laughs> you know, I need to plan this thing out. This needs to be really precise. Most things are not like that. Yeah. You know, so when we're launching out with a new concept or new idea or making a crazy decision, I'm 100% with you. Yeah, you can take a little bit of time to get an idea, but you probably just need to start acting and then figure it out as you go. And we hear that all the time. Lots of successful people follow that. Well, I love the example you gave. You took action. Wifey's holding you accountable. And then I'm putting it in quotes, synchronistically, serendipitously, this woman happened to be doing uh, a two-day seminar and and so just know that yeah. you know law of attraction I love how somebody says like the last five letters are action you can't just sit on your couch and <laughs> and dream about writing a book or you know starting a business or getting into that relationship and but also time out can because I know your former life is is kind of more um church-based can we talk about how I also don't believe the how is our job like trying to make something happen. Do you know what I mean? Like being mm -hmm. very limited perspective. This is the only way it's going to come about. Yeah. How, what's it's yeah. the fine line of let's use the term surrender. Mm -hmm. Having a clear vision and allowing it to unfold. How do we step into that? Yeah, boy, I, you may have a clearer answer than I do on that to be very candid. Cause I feel like I, I went through kind of a process, even myself, you know, when I first launched out into ministry, for example, um, <laughs> you'll probably laugh at this. The first role I got was as a youth pastor. Now that doesn't sound funny until I tell you I was 40 years old and I had never been to a youth service in my entire lifetime. I was not raised in church. I'm not a church kid. So I was like, what does that look like? Well, the first thing that happened was I, I ended up, getting a role. Obviously I got a job and I sat down I'll never forget my first day. The senior pastor came in, he brought in these two huge binders and he dropped them on my desk and he goes, here, man, I bought you these. I'm like, what are they? He's like, Oh, these are, I can't remember who the particular author of this stuff was, but Oh, this is basically a how to, this is how you youth pastor. This is how you write messages. This is how you do everything. 
And Heather, maybe that's just not my personality uh, that doesn't fit with that. But he didn't tell me I had to. <laughs> Thank God. Because he walked out and I'm like, shoved him in the shelf and I never opened them again. That's just not how I like to go about things. I'm not looking to copycat everybody. And not that you can't learn from other people. Of course you do. Well, yeah, but don't for, reinvent the wheel when you don't have to. Yeah, there's definitely some of that, you know, yeah. but I've always enjoyed looking at things from different angles. And so I think, you know, over the course of years, whatever organization I was involved with or whatever, I am someone who will question things. And at times it was perceived as me not being in alignment or being, you know, I, I don't see the vision or I'm not in alignment with the mission or whatever. And sincerely, it really was never that for me. It was just like, okay, I know you said we always do things this way, but we're back to the why question. Why do we always do that? Yeah. Why do we do things this way? Why do we handle this particular? And usually the answer I would get, well, that's what we've always done. That's what works. It's like, is it really, you know? So I think I kind of naturally question things. And so I always love to hear different approaches on how people are attacking problems. And to me, that's a very healthy thing. I don't know if I answered your question, um, but <laughs> those well, are the okay. things that come to mind. So I'm going to speak from a, about a little bit more of a quantum physics angle. And quantum physics simply states everything is energy. Your thoughts are energy. Your emotions are feelings. We are energetic beings living in an energetic universe. And so the old way of doing things is Newtonian physics, cause and effect, right? Mm, Waiting yeah. for an external cause, getting a job, making more money to create an internal effect and emotion. But quantum physics, this is, I love this stuff. And there's some, I experiment with it all the time because I have a lot of fun. But quantum physics teaches because the mind is the cause of every effect in our life that we can literally cause an effect. And so let me give a real world example. Um, when it comes to the old way of doing things, 3D, let's say you want to get a new job. The old way of doing it would be to update your resume and apply to a hundred different job postings and online and, and manic manifest and hit up a bunch of recruiters trying to make something happen. Yeah. Even in the dating world, which we all bitch and complain about getting on an app and swiping, trying to find a connection or, and this is what Dispenza teaches. And I have a lot of fun doing it. When you have a clear intention and again, this is not sitting on the couch. You have to follow those nudges of taking action or making that phone call or going to the store. And anyway, you have a clear intention. I'll give a one I, I literally did a couple months ago. So I wanted to go to a Denver Nuggets game. That, that was my clear intention, but I wanted to go for free. So I wanted to attend a Nuggets game for free. That's it. I let it. And then I surrendered. I let it go. In less than a week, a guy I met last summer, six months ago, quote, text me out of the blue. Hey, I've been thinking about you, wondering what you're up to. I have an extra ticket to the Nuggets game tonight. Do you want to go? And that's how I want to let people know whether, and look, I've done this for a desire to live in San Diego. How that came about was really cool. When I do this with money, sports tickets, I've done it gazillions times. And and maybe you have too without realizing, holy crap, I I did that. And so yeah. the metaphor I used for my cousin recently, because she was having a lot of resistance around a desire. Mm. And I was like, think about it like Amazon. You go on, you search for what you want. You place your order and you let go, right? You're not wondering who's going to package it, when it's going to get shipped, mm. who's going to deliver, when it's going to arrive. You That's have the point. clear intention place your order, and then you trust in the unfolding. And I feel that's what holds so many people back or analysis paralysis yeah. is trying to make it happen from a very limited perspective. I went on a tangent. No, that was really good. I'm glad. See, I didn't tell you this on the pre-interview, but this is partly why I wanted to talk to you too, because I'm fascinated with this kind of stuff. I have actually experienced what you described. And the funny thing was most of it wasn't conscious. And I'm actually on this journey now to be self-aware and mindful yeah. and conscious about it. Yeah. And there's a lot that I know I don't know. And that's why I'm on a learning journey too, like everybody. But I think, um, I think what you tapped into is so true. And 
And honestly, I think a lot of times we don't get a lot of the things that we desire in life because we don't put it out there at all. Yeah. Even out of our own mouth. It yeah. literally, I mean, I've seen this happen even with people that I've coached over the years where something comes out, they're 45, 50 years old, and they talk about something they've always dreamed about doing that they've never said to any single human being on the planet. Yeah. You know. Well, and even you're right in that note, uh, I didn't realize this, but a lot of people don't even have clarity what they want. And it's like, well, you got to start there. What do you want? So here's what I want to ask you, because I know you're really big on on courage. And I asked before we started recording, can you please share your billboard message that you want people to know? Yeah, my billboard message is, is I believe everyone was created to be courageous. I believe everyone was created with a creative genius. And I believe everyone was created with compassion or to be compassionate. And on the courage side of things, what I mean by that is I believe courage is something that is already inside of you. It's, it's a force part of that energy. Cause I completely agree with you the way we're created. We are energy. That's really once the skin, if it were to be taken away, where many people describe it as we're billions of little lights you know, form together. We don't need to get in the weeds with that, but you know, <laughs> you're, you're this force. So I believe that courage, that force of courage is already in there. And I think what's interesting is, is we, we actually see it come out in certain situations when there's, if I could say it this way, a life or death demand. Uh, I, I recently saw this story that I was like, so fascinated because to me, it, it portrays this. I saw a video and it was probably an Instagram reel or something. Don't even remember where I saw it, but it was a lady had driven into a frozen lake in her SUV accidentally, obviously. And there was a couple of people staying on the shore, but there was this one kid who was like 17 years old and somebody was filming this whole thing, which already tells you already, okay, <laughs> dude, why were you filming this instead of doing something? But that's another story. And you see this kid jump into this freezing water, immediately climb into the back of this SUV where the window had actually, the rear window had been rolled down. And he's and this thing's sinking. Now it was sinking slowly, but it's still sinking in a frozen lake. And he pulls out the dog and throws the dog to the, to the people that are on the shore. And then he climbs back in and pulls her out. Well, what is that? Well, that's an innate courage that is already in there. And we hear it when people get interviewed after the fact, right? How did you go into that? burning building. What were you thinking? It's like, I didn't think I didn't have time to think I needed to act. Yeah. So that's in there, but most of our life doesn't put that type of demand on it. So it requires even more intention to recognize you have the ability to be courageous, no matter what life hands you, no matter what situations punch you in the face, you have in you the ability to be courageous, fight back and overtake fear or whatever it is that's holding you back. Well, and that's what, honestly, like I want to just shout from the rooftops for people to get out of their own way and and not live life in mediocrity and going through the motions because I truly believe every single one of us can live an extraordinary life. So I want to ask you this. Yeah. If people like, and that's the, it ultimately came to me to like a burning sensation. It incessant, it wouldn't stop when I wanted to quit corporate. And I finally follow the nudge and I've been always, I've been provided for since I left and a lot of fear, a lot of unknowns. And like, you have to trust that the, like the next step will unfold before you, but for somebody sitting in that space and, and feeling this burning desire, they're meant for more. Yeah. What is the, the first next step they could take? Yeah. Well, I think one thing that we all recognize, I don't think this is really up for debate is that fear is the thing that, that you know, keeps everybody from doing anything. That's not profound. That's not new news, right? Yeah. Uh, I actually have a talk and it's titled Eating Fear for Breakfast. Now it's a cutesy title, but the reason why I like it and why I said that, and because I, I use the word breakfast is because, you know, I know with intermittent fasting now, not everybody eats breakfast every day, but the point is normally you eat every day, right? And that's what fear does. Fear comes at you every day. There's not a day where fear is not trying to convince you of something else, you know? So you have to learn how, to fight that. And again, you know, I, I know this is kind of retreading what I already said, but to me, it always starts with your question starts with who do I want to be? Mm-hmm. Then once I know who I want to be, okay. So then what's the impact I want to have? I'm, I'm kind of reading into your story a little bit. 
and correct me if I'm wrong, please. I have no problem with that. But I'm thinking that's probably kind of what happened to you with this corporate thing where you're in this corporate world chasing this American dream, right? And you're realizing, I, I hate what I'm doing because the impact that you want to have wasn't happening doing what you were doing. Is that a fair statement? 100%. Yeah. So you got to know who you are. Yeah. And that may take a little time. You know, I hope people listening to us right now realize that this is all part of a journey too, and that you don't have to apply everything we're talking about tomorrow and expect your life changes overnight. No, But, but it kind of does change overnight in a sense, right? When yeah. you start thinking differently, yeah. you're now moving in a different trajectory. So there is a change in that regard. 100%. You can have quantum jumps, but it is cliche, but it is a journey. Like you don't, it doesn't stop until you take your last breath. Yeah. Yeah. Here's what I, oh, go ahead. I was just going to ask you, do you use the word destiny much anymore? Um, uh, I can't say I do. See, that was a word we used to use a lot, you know, and especially again, I come from a lot of the church world. We always talk about destiny, destiny, destiny. And I really have stopped using that. And now I use the word journey and can it be a matter of semantics? I guess. But I do think there's a difference because destiny implies that if I do ABC, then I arrive to this destination or this goal or this dream. And now it is finished. Oh. I, I have reached my destiny. Well, okay. So then what? <laughs> then what, right? We know there's a world full. There's plenty of data out there about this. Multi-millionaires and billionaires who achieved that dream of making wealth and that are the most miserable people on the planet. So I think when you said the word journey, that's really important. You know, it we're on this journey and, and it's never ending. There's always more. And that's not greedy. That's growth. If you see it that way. Yeah. And I think ultimately for me is I wasn't fulfilled in a nine to five. I wanted to do something fulfilling in which I felt on purpose. And I simply followed the nudge. Yeah. Here's what I want to ask you, because we've touched on a lot. What do you believe is a key takeaway you want listeners to get? Yeah, well, to me, the key takeaway today is what your show is all about. And that is, is that you control your future. You have you are the strongest voice mm. in your life and where you're going to go in your life than anyone else on the planet. I don't care who you love. I don't care who surrounds you. There is no one that has a more powerful voice than you. And so if you're not hearing <laughs> from the external world what you want to hear about your life, you probably need to start internally, point the finger at yourself, which I've seen you do a couple of times today, and you need to start speaking to yourself mm. because it, I really do, and I don't think you said this earlier. I think I heard you say it on one of the episodes I listened to, but it really is the stories we tell ourselves. You know, and and like, for example, with me and, and I lost my son, which is a heavy story and there is a heaviness to it and there's pain and grieving and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, part of what has helped us move forward is even our pain. We have told it how to behave. We have told it what kind of a story is going to come out of the rest of our lives. We haven't just allowed those things to happen randomly. And so that's probably a long answer, but I just, I just love the simplicity of you really do dictate what you can receive out of life. And so stop sitting on the sidelines, stop the pity party, stop telling yourself or letting other people tell you who you can be and start believing in yourself and then find some people around you. Even if it's got to be new people that, that are willing to jump in with you and say, I believe in you too. I'll help you. Preach. I love that. Did that um, work? Good. Yes. I'd love to wrap up. It. So much pressure when you asked me that. No, um, you, you have so much practice in this. I'd love to wrap up the interview. So I have a few rapid fire questions. Mm. What is a quote or motto that you live by? Quote or motto that I live by. Yeah. Um, whew, I don't know that I have one, but I think, you know, I think my motto, it, this is going to be corny as all get out, but one of the things that I truly do believe people ask me, you know, who are you? It's how I want to be remembered, you know? So for me, the the cheesy thing would be is treat other people the way you'd want to be treated. To me, at the end of the day, no matter what I accomplish, I want people when they remember me 
to say, man, I remember how he treated me. Yeah, no, I love that. What is the book you're currently reading or highly recommend? Actually, I'm reading about three at once right now. But the one I got right here is, this is actually a friend of mine. It's called Leveling Up. His name is Ryan Leak. And it's only about a quarter of the way into it. But it's a business book technically, but it's got some really great questions and exercises to ask yourself because the premise of the book is your own personal and professional development. So it actually very much fits quite a bit of what we've been talking about. Well, and I have found in business, it is, you know, I used to talk about 80, 20, 80% mindset, 20% strategy. I'm more on like 90, 10 at this point (laughs) because I, I had expensive lessons, went all in on strategy and realized I didn't have the belief and the the disciplines and habits behind a successful, and again, that was an identity shift, but yeah. anything in life, I don't care if it's cliche, I'm I'm saying it, that it's mindset. It's, you got to have the mindset first. So I love that. Absolutely. All right. Final question. What advice would you give your younger self? Mm. Yeah. My younger self would be, be much well, actually, I'm going to back up because I don't want to I want to say this correctly. Surround yourself with people that are already doing the things you want to do. Mm-hmm. The reason I corrected myself, just to be clear, because you heard I had some drug abuse, you know, during certain parts of my life or whatever. And a lot of times when we hear things like that, we say, well, that's it's because you hang around with the wrong crowd. Well, if you're in the crowd, you are part of that wrong crowd. So for me, it's just really important that whatever trajectory you want to end up in life, that you surround some people around you that have actually already been there and can help you get there. We are the average of the five people we spend the most time with. Yes. It's timeless. Great note to end on, Clint. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah. Thank you, Heather. It was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it.